All right, everybody, it's one o'clock here, Central Time. Thanks for joining us today, and welcome to the eighth episode of Ewing's U. I'm Pierre Espada, and once again, I'll be your host today. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm also one of the co-founders of the Little Warrior Foundation and dad to 12-year-old Little Warrior Lucy. Today, we're excited to be hearing from Dr. Dave Margolis to provide us with an intro to BMT, otherwise known as stem cell transplant. And we will have a follow-up discussion um, and assessment of this therapeutic approach for Ewing sarcoma. Briefly, Dr. Margolis earned his medical degree from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine in 1989, and then did his residency in pediatrics in 1992 and subsequent fellowship in Pete's Hemonc in 1995, both while at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Currently, Dr. Margolis wears many hats professionally. He is the program director at, medical, at the Medical College of Wisconsin's Bone Marrow Transplant and Cellular Therapy Program, a pro professor and interim chair of pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and the interim pediatrician in chief at Children's Wisconsin. In addition to this work, he volunteers his time on numerous advisory boards and committees. And of significant note to this community, he has been honored with numerous awards for his outstanding commitment to patient care. And lastly, as we'll see in a moment, he has vast experience carrying out bone marrow transplants in both cancer and blood disorder setting. But before we kick things off with Dr. Dave Margolis, I just want to let everybody know and remind you all that Ewing's You is a webinar and podcast production of the Little Warrior Foundation. We are a national childhood cancer foundation with a laser focus on finding a complete and permanent cure for Ewing sarcoma. We were founded in April of 2020 and have granted out $1.4 million in high potential therapies for increasing survivorship and decreasing toxicity. We very much so rely on the support of the communities of the big and little warriors who join us on this webinar today. We are, really appreciate all of our community support to continue our mission so that we can continue to bulldoze our way towards a solution and continue this vital work. In addition to my omnipresent co-host, Emily, today we're also honored to have a special guest, Hillary. Hillary is a dear friend, a member of the Scientific Advisory Board at Little Warrior Foundation, and most importantly, mother to Ian. Sadly, after a four year battle, which included two bone marrow transplants, Ewing sarcoma took Ian's life away too soon at the young age of 18. We are so, so grateful to have Hillary here with us today to offer her unique patient perspective. Hillary, if you wouldn't mind um, just introducing yourself and then we'll hand it off to Emily for a couple of housekeeping items and then we'll let Dr. Margolis go with this presentation. Yeah, thanks, Piero. Um, again, I'm Hillary, and um, Ian was diagnosed in 2018 with extremely high risk um, Ewing sarcoma with 100 plus tumors. Um, he did the front line of treatment just like everyone else, relapsed after five months. Um, with his extreme situation, we looked at transplant. Um, he did an auto transplant and also an aloe transplant. Um, Unfortunately, it did not work. We did see a lot of pluses and minuses to our situation. Um, and during that time, Dr. Margolis, we give a lot of thanks for his care for our family and for all the patients at Children's. Um, it was exceptional and um, I'm happy to have him here with us. Thanks, Hillary. Is that no, we're going to just let Emily, Emily's going to go and then you, just one second, thanks. A really quick housekeeping. Uh, we are recording today's session and we will make this recording available uh, on our website in the blog section. You can find all of the previous recordings of Ewing's You there if there's any topics you want to catch up on. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Margolis as uh, as he presents, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, at the conclusion of his planned remarks, we'll leave plenty of time for a question and answer. Um, as a reminder, as always, we cannot uh, discuss specific cases or provide direct medical advice in this webinar. The information today is to be um, for educational purposes only. So with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Margo Margolis. Thank you, Emily. And let me see if I can share my screen. How does that look? 
Can you Great. see it? All yeah. Right. And you can hear me okay? Absolutely. All right. Well, it, it is an honor um, to be uh, amongst all of you. Um, and uh, I welcome all questions. Uh, as And I really appreciate Emily's uh, ground rules right there. Uh, and if I'm going too fast or too slow, just give me that feedback. And uh, here are my correct, uh, credentials, one of Ian's doctors, and we talked about the other stuff. And I believe my email address there, communication is 95% of what we do. And if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out. And if I don't answer, what Hillary would you say? If I don't answer within 24 hours, repeat? repeat? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, I do have a couple uh, disclosures. Uh, the Home Office makes me disclose this. Um, I, 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 I'm on the Speakers Bureau for a drug called Defibrotide, so I disclose that. And then I'm a BMT doctor. I, 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 um, uh, I, I'm not a frontline Ewing sarcoma oncologist. I utilize uh, bone marrow transplant when I'm asked to, and I try to do that in the best way possible for, for an individual patient. So that's my other um, disclaimer. So my, the goals for the talk are, uh, as Piero said, I wanna discuss the basics of BMT. I wanna discuss um, the concepts of BMT for Ewing, review some recent data, and there, there's some, been some nice publications in the last two years, and I just wanna show those, maybe with too many words, but the slides will be shared, um, and, and uh, you, uh, you can uh, have that. And then I think one of the most important things is to empower you to discuss the role of transplant for your loved one with Ewing sarcoma. Uh, and that is uh, probably the reason um, uh, many people uh, join webinars like this. And one of my roles as a doctor, no matter what I'm doing, is to empower people to ask the right questions and to advocate. So a couple uh, terms, bone marrow. Bone marrow is the organ of the body where you make red cell, white cells, and platelets. I like to, you know, we're from Wisconsin, so it's a bone marrow garden. And so uh, the garden makes flowers, red cell, white cells, and, and platelet flowers. And if you have leukemia or Ewing sarcoma sitting in the bone marrow, we call that weeds. So you can kind of use that uh, seeds, weeds, flowers. And so as you think about it, with whether you're dealing with a five-year-old or a 75-year-old, the garden analogy works pretty well. So the other part of the glossary is autologous. Autologous means from yourself. And it, it is, in my opinion, reasonably crude. But this is how it works. If some chemotherapy is good, more chemotherapy would be better. And so that is, that, that is really what we're doing in an autologous transplant. We are removing the regrowth of bone marrow as a dose limiting side effect. When uh, a typical chemotherapy drug is prescribed for whatever the cancer, there has to be programmed blood cell regrowth. Sometimes that's programmed within two weeks. Sometimes it's three weeks, sometimes it's four weeks. There's different dose intensities. But in transplant, we say, ah, to heck with that. Um, we're not gonna worry about the stem cell regrowth because we've frozen the stem cells, put them in the freezer, and then we will push the toxicity of the chemotherapy to other end organs. That's why many of us think this is a little bit crude. And, and hopefully someday um, we'll never have to do these because we will have much better treatments that are able to focus um, uh, um, on the cancer. But until that time, in many situations, we think dose intensity matters. Allogeneic takes very, many of those same concepts, but we then put in a new Im immune system. So we put in somebody else's immune system and we ask the new immune system to potentially find tumor cells and, and do what's called graft versus tumor. Now we know that that works really well for certain for one particular leukemia called CML, and that's a good example of when things get better. We don't do transplants for CML almost ever now because there's a there's a better drug, um, but that concept still works. And so the question is: Is there graft versus tumor in Ewing sarcoma? So uh, somebody won the Nobel Prize for coming up with the concept of the transplant. We talked about more therapy is better. And then we also have reduced intensity transplant. So when you're hearing about a transplant, you ask whether it's a myeloblative, which is a full intensity or a reduced intensity transplant. 
and reduced intensity transplants rely more on the immune system than they do the poisons. So based on the disease and the donor, we develop a package. A package is a conditioning regimen where we condition the body to either be treated and or accept the new immune system. Um, most myeloblative regimens have a drug called busulfan or its cousin triosulfan in there or total body irradiation. Almost always a reduced intensity regimen has fludarabine. And then the other drugs we choose really depend on the underlying disease. We then infuse the stem cells. Uh, they go in as a, as a blood transfusion. They go in right through a peripheral IV or a Hickman. We do not put them into the bone. And then if you're doing an allogeneic transplant, we have to prevent graft versus host disease. Uh, if you're doing an autologous transplant, you don't need to do that. So we suppress the immune system and get rid of the old disease. We then um, uh, put together either a myeloblade or a reduced intensity package. We then have graft versus host disease prevention. And this is for the allos only. It's how much difference is there between you and the donor. Autologous, zero difference. Same genetic code. Identical twin, same genetic code. Anybody else has some protein mismatch. In a matched sibling setting, we call those minor antigens. Very commonly now, people like looking at parents. Um, if we do a parent transplant, it's either half match or half mismatch, depending on whether you look at the world half empty or half full. We tend to say, we tend to say half match, but the little asterisk is there. It's also half mismatch. But by definition, your parent is half. You get because you get half your genetic code from your mom and half from your dad. And then the concept is for certain diseases, one's own bone marrow is a good source. So that would be ideally somebody who doesn't have cancer in their bone marrow. And for others, it would maybe be better to have somebody else's. So the conditioning phase lasts about a week. The wait for engraftment lasts about three weeks. The initial post engraftment phase is one to three months. And then we have long-term follow-ups and the concept of survivorship. Uh, there are side effects or souvenirs of having treatment that one will last forever. Uh, a parent, uh, parent one taught, the ones taught me don't use the word cure, use the word survivor, because we always have to deal with it, but we just want to be surviving. Um, and so uh, I will tend to use the word survivorship. Uh, it takes the neutrophil count about three weeks to grow back. Uh, with peripheral blood stem cells, I check actually usually 10 to 15. Usually it takes about six weeks to become platelet and red cell independent. Uh, I told um, Ian and his family that we would get them out of the hospital by about day 40 after the transplant. If we don't, there's a complication. We can usually get people out of the hospital somewhere between day 25 and 30. I don't remember what happened with Ian, but- um, He was a high achiever. He was yeah. a high achiever. We got out of there pretty quick. <laughs> that's, that's because he had a high achieving family that- uh, That's could, right. Could, could that's right. Um, one of the other things is in transplant, we worry more about our oncology colleagues is lymphopenia. The importance of viruses, we've all learned that with COVID, um, the importance of uh, T cells in fighting viruses. When we do bone marrow transplants, we screw up the T cells more than our oncology friends do. So that is that that is an issue. I so, had a quick uh, question come up a lot. Um, when you take the um, cells out to give them later, um, do you... The, the cancer cells that are in the blood, would that just give it, re-give it back to them? That is a, that is the million dollar question. And the, um, there was one gene therapy, I don't think you could do this anymore. When I was younger, there was a study done where they put green fluorescent protein with the stem cell collection. This was a neuroblastoma. And then they infused the cells. And then when the, um, cancer, when patients relapsed, they looked in the cancer cells to see if there was that green fluorescent protein. And about 10% of the time there was. Okay. So we tend to do those stem cell collections after a round or two of chemotherapy to do what's called a biologic purge. There, um, people have looked at trying to purge cancer cells from the stem cell product. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't made it to prime time yet. 
and I don't know if it ever will. So that's why we don't do the stem cell collection right away. We try to give one or two doses of chemotherapy to limit that circulation. But it's a Got great it. question. And it's one that we always worry about. And that one study did show that it is technically possible to reinfuse a cancer cell. Thank you. Um, so this is when I sat with Ian. I This is exactly what I told him. These are 100% of the time what you're at risk at. Um, and, and I always tell my patients that I will make them infertile. Nothing's 100%, but we always have that conversation. And then the less likely but serious are what a mom once called the God forbids. These are the things that you don't want to have happen. They don't happen that often, but when they do, they can lead to death. End organ toxicity, um, serious infections, rejection and severe GVH only occur in a uh, allogeneic transplant. Late effects. So, you know, when we take care of uh, transplanting a five year old, is different than transplanting a 25 year old. Um, you have to think about the impact on growth and development. Um, if you do have an allogeneic transplant, quality of life is very much based on how much chronic reference associates you have. What's the impact on the end organs? What's the impact on the liver, heart, lungs, kidneys? Impact on mental health is huge. And then um, there's a whole field of uh, survivorship. So that's the end of uh, intro BMT 101. And now I'm going to transition into uh, the role of transplant for Ewing sarcoma. Um, I was taught this by one of my mentors once. The art of medicine is making a medical decision when there is not enough data to fully support the decision. That is often what we're doing with Ewing sarcoma, particularly with the role of transplant, as I show you. Um, in my opinion, each individual case will warrant a thorough discussion of the risk, benefits, and alternatives. And a decision made together, in my opinion, is the right decision for each individual patient. So I could have two kids in the, in the clinic with very similar diseases, with very different goals of care and goals for their life, make two different decisions regarding the role of transplant, and both of them can be right. And, and part of that is rooted in there's not enough data to say that this is absolute. Also, data is not always what the family is looking at. We, we particularly were looking at um, a portion of time that he would not have chemo for a while, just to not to have the repeated cycle after cycle after cycle. So there's, that was one plus. And, and that is, um, as we get smarter in medicine, what we call patient reported outcomes, hopefully that we can add patient reported outcomes. And that, that's one of those. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is important. So um, the joy of uh, having a new patient, uh, the joy of, um, and there's never a joy in having a new cancer patient, but the joy of being honored to take care of a new patient, the, the, the joy of trying to keep up is with PubMed, you can just keep redoing literature searches. So whenever I see a new patient, I, I like to see what, what, what's out there new. And so um, the being asked to do this talk um, allowed me to go back to the literature and look at what do we what have we learned in the last couple of years? And so that I'm going to highlight some recent data um, that's in the literature. Um, and so this is the first one. And Cochrane database is what people use for evidence-based medicine. It, it is um, uh, people love quoting Cochrane databases. And so um, they looked for evidence on whether high-dose chemotherapy plus autologous stem cell transplant improved med-free survival, overall survival, quality adjusted survival, and progression-free survival better than conventional therapy in children and adolescents and young adults with their first recurrence. So that's why, I, so this is not every possible opportunity. This is just first recurrence. And this is what is really sobering for people like us. They did a thorough, extensive search of the medical literature, and they said they were unable to draw any conclusions. And our results show that further research is needed. So yes, that can piss you off, as it should, 
And it does prove, in my opinion, that there's more than one way to approach the problem. Are we gonna ever have evidence-based guidelines for this disease? That will be a goal. And I, I know that was one of the questions that was once asked of me. Um, but I think we have to realize that um, it may be difficult because people have been, there's publications going back 25 years and uh, uh, it, it's hard to, to sort through. So knowing that, we're gonna go through some individual questions that have been asked in, in either multi-center clinical trials or single institutions. So this uh, comes from the Journal of Clinical Oncology published in 2019. And this is what is one of the Euro Ewing study. And so uh, this gets to be a little noisy, but um, this is the purpose of the study was to look at Bucelfa melphalan as, a, as a rescue with whole lung radiation on event, free, on event free survival compared to standard chemotherapy with whole lung radiation in Ewing sarcoma presenting with pulmonary and or pleural mets, metastasis. So that is the specific group. And this is where it gets to be interesting on in clinical trials. This study was open for 15 years across the world and random allocation. So this is how, this is a, we, we, uh, one of the questions is, how in the world could, could we not get answers? Well, this is what happens. You, you're across the world, you, you screen for eligibility, you find 540 patients. Of those, some don't get enrolled, 287 get enrolled, and there you go. So in 15 years, they were able to randomize 287 people. And this is the data. Um, when you're looking at Kaplan-Meier curves, um, to be very honest, higher is better when survival is on this axis. If relapse is on this axis, flip your brain, lower is better. So this happens to be a survival curve. And this is event-free sur event survival means surviving without relapse. Overall survival is surviving, but having had a relapse. And so in this particular study, um, the Bucelfa and Melphalan is here. The uh, standard chemotherapy is here for event-free survival, but the overall survival is there. And that's how they came to the conclusion that there's no benefit to survival. One of the questions I was asked for this webinar is what's the difference in side effects? And I think this plot is a nice little summary of what the difference in side effects are. This is the transplant. This is the chemo and radiation. Transplant is more likely to cause trouble with the GI tract, the liver, general deterioration, infection, lung toxicity just barely. And then chemotherapy is more likely to cause heart problems, neurologic problems, and kidney problems. That's how this sort of settled out in this particular study. So the conclusions of this study is did not, it, this study did not support a change in the standard of care for Ewing sarcoma with isolated pulmonary metastasis. They, they realized that those numbers, 40, 50, 60, are uh, higher than anticipated historic series. Um, and they talked about the length of the study um, and the need to improve the outcome uh, uh, demonstrates the need for large cooperative studies to answer questions in a timely manner. All something that I know you all are advocating for, we're advocating for. The question is, how do you pull that off? Right. I was just, uh, as I said yesterday, it would be great if they could take Epic and um, every single hospital documents everything and it's all compiled into a, a study on its own. <laughs> I don't dis I, I don't disagree, and I'm sure some statistician would have a problem. Someday, with that, but someday. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm moving on to another uh, another uh, um, study because I, I found this was interesting. This was published in um, 2021, um, and this is long term follow up of high dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue in children, young adults with metastatic or relapsed Ewing sarcoma. So once again, 
defining the patient population. And single center studies have the benefit of people being treated a very similar way over a period of time. The problem is that you know, how, trans how translatable is it to other centers? But this is 47 patients. Look at that time range, 20 years. Um, and then they used either two transplants or one transplant. Um, they use a drug called Topotecan that is not in a lot of other uh, studies, but that's what they did. This is City of Hope, by the way, um, that, that the, the, um, the center in San Diego or LA, I can't remember where it is. So these are the, these are the survival graphs. This is um, a single or tandem transplant. This is single or tandem transplant. Once again, probability of survival, disease-free survival covering somewhere between 40 and 50%. And that's what, what's remarkable about this study is the length of time, that's 10 years. That's some, so sometimes, some studies you'll look at, it's two year survival. This, is, this has got the benefit of some really long follow-up. Um, this is overall a disease-free survival, all comers, not separating out one or two, um, hovering around 50% over time in a high risk group. This is, this is one of the take home messages. Um, and this is not just for Ewing sarcoma, this is for lots of cancers with the role of transplant. The, this is disease-free survival or event-free survival based on disease status of transplant. First remission, Second remission or partial remission are the solid lines. Greater than third remission, greater than second partial response or advanced disease are the dashed lines. Now, some of us would argue that none of these lines are at zero. And so I think that's an important concept that none of the lines are zero. And in this particular institution, Patients with metastatic or relapse Ewing sarcoma who are taken to transplant early on had a reasonably strong uh, survival curve. Not ideal, but a reasonably strong survival curve. Um, this is relapse prior to transplant. This is one of those, well, of course, Dave, if you haven't relapsed, you're gonna do better. Um, but, 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 that then goes back to the first study that said maybe there's no benefit to transplant. This is why it gets really confusing. But this is this group who who uh, would never relapse has survival curves around seventy percent. This is and this is relapse early late versus relapse early. Relapse early, not as good as survival. Relapse late, better survival. Never having a relapse the best survival in this cohort of 47 patients. So I think instructive, um, I actually looked at our internal data and uh, we, we don't have 47, we've got, and, and, and our numbers are similar, but I wasn't able to look at whether who'd relapse or not. I just looked at alive and dead in, in trying to discuss that. So I think the, these, these numbers are, reasonably reproducible, I think. And so this is one of the most important thing, chemo sensitivity. That goes back to if some chemo is good, more chemo is better. Um, and then if you're choosing some, if, if somebody's had a, rate le a late relapse, they're more, more likely to do well. And a lot of the Ewing's patients are really chemo sensitive, but if they're not, that's the ones that should stay away from that. I'm looking at a time check, so I'm gonna keep going fast. Um, <laughs> this is uh, high dose trio, which is not available in the United States yet. It's a cousin of yourself and Melflan versus standard therapy for high risk metastatic Ewing sarcoma. And I'm gonna send, uh, I'm gonna jump to the curves. In this particular study, which is also part of Euro Ewing's, there is no benefit to transplant. And the survival curves are really poor at three and five years. 
So I think this is sobering. Um, uh, and uh, one would need to go back and absolutely, this is this is where that Cochrane come, comes, it, it, it is confusing because I just showed you some good data and this is a multi-institutional study with, um, with all arms being lower even this early in the survival um, curve process. That was similar. And this is my last one. Um, I don't put it in because one of the author's name is Lang, but this is, a, this is the group from Germany and Austria. Um, they've been looking at Ewing sarcoma transplants for most of my career. And I, I just think this is a really um, interesting study because they've been looking at allogeneic transplants. And this is patients with advanced Ewing sarcoma. I was asked, you know, What's advanced Ewing sarcoma? This is how they defined it: presence of presence of uh, two or more bone mets and or bone marrow involvement and or relapse less than two years after diagnosis. So that's the group, and and you'll be able to read in the slides the theory. I'm not going to jump into that, but we can visit if people want. And this is an update to their studies, and once again sobering. These are their survivals for. Um, uh, matched or mismatched transplants uh, overall. Um, but then you look and, you, and uh, who's got, who's in remission and who's got persistent disease. So the take home here is persistent disease doesn't do you any good. A, a transplant will not do you good if you have active disease when you go to transplant. Um, and one would argue that these survival curves are not much different than an autologous uh, survival curve. And so um, it is to be determined whether an allo transplant implicates a therapeutic benefit over standard therapy. If we say standard therapy is not an allo transplant. So. The one thing that we got out of the um, allo transplant was, um, a reset on Ian's bone marrow. And um, he, even though he did relapse, he was able to take chemo after that repeatedly and be able to recover. And I don't think he would have been able to do that at all had we not done that. And, and I think that that is one of those, um, I told the group on, on here yesterday, um, one of my best friends growing up died of Ewing sarcoma when I was a young doctor. He was a young patient at MD Anderson. and. Um, he taught me uh, one thing that I learned from that. He said, he said, Dave, none of the doctors ever want to come here and trade places with me. I said, I said, Tommy, you're right. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing he, we, we talked about, uh, for whatever reason, the doctors at MD Anderson refused to collect his stem cells. And it drove me nuts for exactly the reason that Hillary said, at some point you can use stem cells to re reset the clock to give more chemo. Um, that may not be, a goal of care with a survival curve, but it does it does give somebody more quality of lifetime, um, uh, and, and I I think is an important part of the equation. So uh, my personal opinion, there is a role in certain situations for transplant for patients we're dealing. Defining that situation for an individual involves significant risk benefit alternative discussions, and as we learn about individual biology, individual pharmacology, that is gonna help us within reason, but it's gonna make those big studies even more challenging because we're gonna have smaller numbers in each, in each group. So there are some statisticians have to figure that out. Um, clinical trials will always be the best way to answer questions and they are challenging. They've got their own limits. Um, to me, the take home, and you guys are probably already doing this, it's one of the um, benefits of groups like Little Warrior um, for every disease is always feel empowered to have discussions with one's own doctor. And then um, advice is free to get what you pay for it. Feel free to email me. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll stop the share. And then if you want to answer questions or I can put the share back up if people want to see any of the other data but I wanted to try to 
give ample time for questions. Thank you, Thank you for that. For that, Dr. Margolis was quite quite thorough, and I appreciate the deep dive and and trying to tease out that data. It's really hard to conclusively make a suggestion, and I think to your point, it's got to be highly individualized. Um, one question that popped into my mind: it's it seemed to suggest overall that, or at least the data seemed to suggest that the earlier that one went to a transplant, um, if they were to relapse, it seemed like the outcome was better. And I'm trying to tease out why you think that is. Is it just purely the, the disease is less advanced? And would we need to do some sort of balanced study versus, you know, say for first salvage therapy, which is, you know, for Ewing's, it's IT or VIT at this point in time to really conclusively say, you know, one one therapy is better than the other. I I know that's a loaded question, but uh, so help me understand it. So up up front, don't do the transplant. Do the transplant after a relapse. Well, upon first relapse, I guess the question upon is first, should, okay. So that's what I mean. Upon first relapse. So yeah. um I'm gonna take it one step earlier. Yep. Is I think part of the hardest decision making on what using that single institution study. Yep. Um patient selection for transplant without a relapse. So that that is um to me one of the first questions. And then if you relapse, what is the role of transplant? And if it's a trans, if it's a relapse that happened early after the chemotherapy ended within those first two years, the data that would suggest that transplant might not be as helpful as you want it to be. And it does sometimes become a self-fulfilling prophecy because the more you beat up the body, the more transplant related complications you can have. Mm -hmm. So that's where it is sitting down with the team and saying, um, okay, what do you think is best for my child? And um, I was taught that transplant is a high risk, high reward um, treatment. And to what Hillary said, a lot of times that decision on transplant puts a lot of the therapy and a lot of the risk into a three month window instead of a year window. Autologous transplant, autologous transplant. Mm -hmm. um, allogeneic transplant, because you're dealing with a new immune system, those side effects never go away. But autologous transplant, um, you get to day 100 after an autologous transplant, and you've got decent organ function, the likelihood of other problems happening is pretty low. Most of the blank happens in the first couple of months. Okay. Did I answer the question? You did, absolutely. Hillary M, do you have any questions? Um, I do. I have um, something that I think this community often finds frustrating is you know, with about 250 to 300 new diagnoses a year, uh, you look at these clinical trials that have 287 um, patients over the course of 10 years uh, and, and the results still aren't promising. I, I'm kind of curious about where you think the rule for like innovation is or basket trials, smaller trials. Are there ways that we can get more nimble in trying um, uh, new new techniques in this space um, that don't require 287 patients in 10 years? I think there have to be. I'm not a smart enough statistician to understand it. Um, Mary Horwitz, who uh, is one of my mentors, she used to run the CIBMTR. If you ever Google Mary Horwitz's name, um, uh, she's actually on faculty here. Uh, and uh, she's closer to retirement. Uh, um, and so she's led a wonderful career. But her, she has challenged the transplant community to come up with better ways to do studies because the old way, we're never going to get anything approved if we keep relying on the same old, same old. And so, um, and the flip side will always be, what are we missing when we do a, a trial like that? And um, I don't know, I, I, 
I purposely missed all statistical um, classes. So um, <laughs> I, I, I am much more of an art. Uh, I think Hillary will. Art of medicine, for sure. <laughs> I, I, I am much more of an art of medicine guy than I am a um, uh, statistical a statistical guy. Although mm -hmm. I, I think I think statistics have to guide us. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think society and the government, and part of this is the FDA. Society, the FDA, the government have to come up with better ways to assess yeah. a right and wrong. It's, it's like you need incubators. You need boom, 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 boom. Not, you know, how can you make, what can you do with 20 patients? What mm -hmm. can you learn from 20 patients and then take that to another 20 patients? Because you just saw that, 15 years to get 287. So that's a, that's that's ridiculous. Like a challenge. It's yeah. really str uh, a struggle. And that was an international study. That was, uh, Doug Hawkins, who's now the head of COG, was one of the uh, PIs of that. I remember talking to Doug when, when he was not the head of uh, um, uh, COG, but he was just a, 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 an oncologist in, in Seattle. And wasn't that year old trial, like there was some statistical insignificance by like, like the P factor was like 0.06. So right, it might suggest like had the cohort been larger, Yes. You would have had statistical exactly. significance, right? And then that, that just like kind of maddening from a parent standpoint of like, is it better or is it not? Because yeah, now you have nothing, right? Like you don't really know. Um, anyways, we could go on and on about statistics forever. The questions are starting to roll in here. So we'll start to ask them here. What from the from the viewers that is, what blood parameters might suggest a patient is vigorous enough for plants for a transplant, i.e., like who is an ideal patient for a transplant? Oh, um, I don't. I, I don't worry about their blood parameters because I'm going to fix their blood. Uh, um, I'm going to fix their blood by giving them stem cells. So you got to get the stem cells collected first. Okay. So Is the there anything? Cells, Go ahead. Uh, once the stem cells are collected, um, we look at performance status. Um, how is somebody's liver function? How is somebody's kidney function? How is their heart function? Um, uh, quite frankly, um, how is their um, psychiatric function, depression is a risk factor. Um, uh, how is their neurologic function? So we, we actually have some, the, the, the best answer is, the, the, the easiest one is performance status. How active are they? Um, and, and then what, is, what are what we call comorbidities? The fewer, uh, and then we come up with a comorbidity score. We're starting to use that a little bit more. Uh, the more beat up you are, the, the, the more likely we are to cause harm when we do the dose intensity. So there's like no minimum from like a platelet standpoint. Oh God, like no, those I, classic I, CBC. Okay. I, I, I don't know. I don't. My personal view is I yeah. don't care because I'm going to fix it. Um, so I do want the A and C over 500. Okay, I there you go. I do. Well, no, no, because I can fix red cell transfusion. And I can give red cell transfusions, but if I'm giving red cell transfusions, we want to make sure somebody's not iron overloaded. Mm -hmm. I can give platelet transfusions, kind of make sure that they don't get chewed up immediately. But the, the key is A and C, because I don't want come, somebody coming into transplant with an invasive fungal infection sitting in their lungs. So um, Hillary, is that, did, did I practice what I preach? You did, yeah. <laughs> he did a thorough um, search of anything wrong, um, renally, um, lungs, all of that before transplant. And blood wise, that was, he said the same thing, pretty much did not care. Okay. Great. We have another great question that came in, um, talking about the role of, um, of stem cell transplant between frontline or, or after frontline treatment, if someone is incredibly high risk, do you, um, do you find that is something that is offered or a, I, a ask for if they're particularly high risk? I, I will go back to the data. Yeah. So, if, so if somebody fits that very high risk category, the evidence that I would use in fighting with the insurance company, because remember that's the other equation is we have to get, you know, somebody, some third party payer has to approve this. I would send that paper from city of hope and say, hey, the group that did best were the high-risk patients that came to transplant before ever relapsing. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we think that that after X number of cycles, if somebody's in a complete remission, we think that their consolidation, I think that's the term my yeah. oncology friends like to use, that yes. that my that the consolidation will would be dose intense chemotherapy instead of the pulse chemotherapy. I have to say, um, it was exact that situation when Ian relapsed after five months after frontline, um, there was, he did 10 rounds of um, the relapse therapy and he was NED after 10 rounds, but you know, 10 months, that's a lot of chemo. And by the end of that, he could not have gone any longer on that regimen, maybe one or two more rounds, but it was just gradually dwindling down his blood cells. And so that was the only thing we could do. And that's my Tommy rule, my friend. I mean, I, I just think that at some point you got to re, you, you got to reset the the marrow clock to allow, um, you know, someday we're gonna we, we we always have you know unfortunately better improvements don't come you know every year but they come in in eras and and so. Um, uh, part of what our responsibility is, is to try to keep trying to keep somebody having quality of life survival. Um, and um, you know, I I remember doing an aloe transplant on a young man from Oshkosh whose dad was an orthopedic surgeon. And I don't know if they're on this call, but um, uh, you know we we did that a long time ago because that was our you have max sibling. That was our best way to just keep plugging away. And uh, did he die of the disease? Eventually he did. It was about 10 years though. And he had, um, so. All right, we're gonna switch gears here a little bit in terms of where the field is headed. Um, do you think BMT plays a role with, in combination with other targeted therapies or is, is the evolution of, of the bone marrow transplant really some of these uh, new cellular therapies like CAR T, et cetera? I um, just want to get you get your thoughts on that. I I, I look forward to the day that more thick chemotherapy is better is 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 not in vogue anymore. That that is yeah we we all look forward to that that day. So uh, a CAR T cell is um, very fancy graft versus tumor. It's your own graft versus your own tumor, and, and so. Uh, um, right now, the, the, the disease that that's easiest is with ALL. Um, why? Because ALL has got a protein called CT, CD20 and we can all live a long life without CD20 expression. So, um, uh, without B cells. So I look forward to auto transplant. More therapy is better being replaced by targeted therapies. Absolutely. Um, do I think it's going to happen right away? No. And part of that is what proteins can we get expressed and what side effects will occur if you knock out those proteins throughout the whole body? Yeah. It's definitely a challenge for sure. Emmy, do you want, want to ask this other question? Yeah, um, we have a question here that says, um, supposedly Ewing sarcoma does not respond well to immunotherapy. Isn't stem cell isn't a stem cell transplant a form of immunotherapy? I, I would say an allogeneic transplant is a form of immunotherapy, and that is that uh, it, it, and it does not respond as well as we would like it to. To most, we're trying to get better. We're trying to get use natural killer cells. We, you know, natural, we've got T cells. Maybe, maybe not so much graft versus tumor with T cells, but we like to think that natural killer cells can knock off um, uh, Ewing sarcoma uh, cells. Um, but autologous transplant, in my mind, is truly not um, immunotherapy. It's truly dose intensity, in my opinion. It's the sledgehammer. The allo transplant is the immunotherapy, and we're trying, but it's clinical. It is investigational. I don't think anybody should ever say that um, allogeneic transplant is a uh, accepted therapy. If it's done on a clinical trial, I think it's very reasonable. 
I was going to ask you about the STIR trial. Um, it, we did that with Ian. Um, where you see that um, going in the future since it closed after Ian, he was, I think the last one you guys yeah. did, but um, I know that you had talked about tweaks that you were gonna do for this trial and maybe reopen. I think what we need to do is figure out, a, I, um, I am, I'm a fan of natural killer cells, um, mm -hmm. have been for a long time. Uh, they, they provide a certain level of um, surveillance and attack that is different than a T cell. I think we need to get better at um, growing natural killer cells, expanding natural killer cells, and having them persist in order to have something like the STIR trial work. Um, natural killer cells, the, the nice thing about natural killer cells is many of us have a donor that would have a graft versus tumor um, difference. Mm -hmm. in a in a close relative because many of the ways that natural killer cells go on and off is different than t-cells and um, our parent donors or our half-sibling donors may have that um, on off in a way that instead of being off because natural killer cells have a natural stop sign and so we mm -hmm. want to get rid of that natural stop sign got it and would that expansion be CAR NK or is this just harvesting the patient's own natural killer cells and, and rebooting? No, that's uh, can what I answer, the, Can I answer, answer yes? Can I answer <laughs> yes? <laughs> all right, that's good. Yeah, sure. Can I answer all of the above? All of the above, mm -hmm. sure. Yes, I, I think that that is, um, uh, if you go to one of the nerd meetings, you'll see a lot, I mean, th those are the abstracts right now. Okay. Uh, and, and the key question is which abstracts will actually lead to a clinical trial? And which um, and 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 you have to you, um, and you have to try. But yes, I, I, I think both. I think both. I think CAR NK, absolutely, um, uh, growing, expanding in in somebody's own milieu. They're all possible. Okay. Are there on that note? I guess there's a follow up question. Are there any NK trials open that you're aware of in the U.S. or elsewhere? I'm going to plead the fifth because I haven't Googled it recently. Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, the group in Seattle has, I don't know, there, there are various groups trying various things at various times. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep absolutely. Uh, any other questions, team? No, I think we, we covered, <laughs> exactly. we covered, we covered a lot. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right, I'll wrap things up here. Dr. Margolis, thanks so much for being here with us and, and tackling this, this tough, tough topic. Uh, you did a very great job, thorough and, and fair. And I, I love the fact that you're so open and um, accessible, right? You just threw out your email address to the world there. And uh, I'm sure people will be knocking on your door because oh, wait. of that. I forgot yeah. to show, wait, 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 wait. Whoa, wait, whoa. wait, 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 I, I have to show this. Okay. Because I, I worked <laughs> hard on this. <laughs> And this is an honor and memory of Ian. And, and uh, Hillary can, can, can uh, so that's a picture that ran in the Milwaukee Journal years ago. That's Phil Jackson. Recognize Phil? Yep. yep. What's Phil doing? He's whining to a rep. And who's the guy in the background? It may appear, <laughs> it may appear that I am yelling at Phil Jackson, but I'm really saying, Thank you <laughs> to all of you. Uh, I completely Aww. forgot I had thrown that slide Aww. in, but so um, Ian busted me in a game. He <laughs> sure did. <laughs> he sure did. Uh, it was quick, real quick story. Um, he was in during transplant. COVID was just starting. Um, everyone knows Margolis is Bucks fan all the way. Um, and he said, watch the, hey, tomorrow, watch the game. I'm going to be out in California. Watch the game. And Ian said, make sure you wear a mask and make sure that you don't bring COVID back. Like, be, wash your hands, do all the things. Well, sure enough, that night we're watching it. And Ian's like, I see him. He doesn't have his mask on. And <laughs> <laughs> busted. He texted him right away and he was like, where's your mask? And Margolis is like, busted, busted. <laughs> It was really cute, but 
I really thank you for coming on here. And I yeah. thank you for all the care that you gave for our family and um, just appreciate everything you did for us. It's our honor and that's why we're here. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Margolis. You're getting much praise too on, in some of the comments here too. So with that note, we'll sign off with everyone. Thank you to the viewers for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back in March with another episode of Viewing Zoo, specifically March 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're heading back to Levine's Children and the BCC Consortium uh, to talk about their uh, precision medicine program, specifically with Dr. Trevelyan. So March 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern, we'll uh, release that link soon enough. Um, please be sure to subscribe to our Ewing's U emails. You can do that by going to littlewarrior.org and navigating the Ewing's U tab on the website and follow us on Instagram and Facebook as we always post about our next speaker that way as well. Um, lastly, and in closing, and I don't know if you know this, Dr. Margolis, we have a unique sign off at Little Warrior that embodies our fight in honor and in memory of so many little big warriors who have faced this cancer. It's how we sign off on all our communications, both internally and externally. It's just simply a swords up on the count of three. Um, so with that, we're signing off everybody until next time. One, two, three. Sorry Sorry up. Up, everyone. We'll see you here next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks.